My name is Romaldo Mayerzenge. I'm the regional, man, regional program manager for Africa for the International Development Law Organization, IDLO. And I would like to welcome you all to this session of the Lean Climate and Security Conference uh, delivered via this webinar. Allow me to extend our appreciation as IDLO to the different cooperating organizations in hosting this webinar, specifically Delphi, a leading independent think tank and public policy consultancy on climate, environmental, and environmental developments. Its mission is to improve governance through research, dialogue, and quotation. I'd like to also acknowledge the participation and cooperation of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, AIK, a nonprofit organization. Its mission is to advance interdisciplinary scientific research and climate impact research. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the contribution and creation of the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Our interests do certainly come together for all the corporate organizations in the hosting of this particular webinar. Allow me to say a little bit about IDLO. IDLO is the only global intergovernmental organization that is exclusively devoted to promoting the rule of law and sustainable development. IDLO sees the rule of law as an integral part of sustainable development which underpins social and economic progress and environmental protection with strong institutions, good governance. Formal legal frameworks and legal empowerment of people, equal opportunity and, and equitable access to basic services through due process and fair outcomes for all. IDLO is an international champion of SDG 16 and it has experience working in more than 90 countries. IDLO has experience, significant experience, working in fragile contexts, including in the Sahel, where we are currently working to reduce the instability by strengthening the criminal justice systems there. Allow me to reference or speak a little bit some of the housekeeping rules um, for this webinar. Please do note that the webinar is being recorded. Um, and also do note that the recording, the recording of the panel discussion will be uploaded on IDLO's website. So it will be available. And I also please do advise that the mute mode be enabled. The webcams and microphones, all attendees will be disabled during the webinar. On, only if given permission by a host, an attendee can be unmuted and talk during the webinar. There is a chat room, and the chat room will be enabled for this webinar. Attendees are allowed to send chat messages to the host, panelists, and attendees hear this meeting chat room. Question and answer. The attendees may use the question and answer window to questions, attendees can like or comment on other attendees' questions. Um, my colleague Giovanni Pilato from IDLO will monitor the question and answer window and he will be sharing those with myself. When asked a question, a question can all attendees kind type information and mention their name, country, or organization. This web seeks to explore the intersection between climate change and violent conflict in the Sahel region. As you all know, there is increasing recognition of the complex link between climate change and human security particularly in relation to violent conflict. Understanding this intersection between climate change and other risk factors for violent conflict is critical 
to design effective strategies to address both the security and to address both the security and the climate risks. Among fragile contexts, the Sahel, a semi-arid region stretching from Senegal to Ethiopia, is particularly vulnerable to both climate change and conflict. There is not, as we all know, a single definition of the Sahel. However, it is generally understood as the semi-arid region south of the Sahara stretching from Senegal to Ethiopia and comprising portions of different countries that include Mali, Burkina Faso, and Mauritania. This region, as we also all know, faces significant challenges, including armed conflict, extreme poverty, food insecurity, and insurgency of jihadist groups. The coup d'etat in Mali in August is a somber reminder of the political instability of the region. Our panel today we'll discuss how the rule of law approaches, including legal empowerment, fair laws, policies, legitimate justice mechanisms and institutions can help address inequalities, grievances, and some of the root causes of conflict in the Sahel. Hopefully so that there is a production of beneficial effects for development goals, particularly for the most vulnerable, including women and children, as these tend to be the most affected by conflict and climate change. The, the, the panel today will seek to address specifically the following questions. How is climate change affecting human security and violent conflict in the Sahel? What contribution can the rule of law provide to address security and conflict risks, risks in the Sahel? And finally, what are the main challenges in strengthening the rule of law in Sahel? At this point, please do allow me to introduce my distinguished panel of speakers. And I will start by introducing Thomas Ritzer. Thomas is a political affairs officer in the policy planning unit of the United Nations Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs, DPPA. His work focuses on analyzing and addressing the impact of climate change on peace and security, including through the development of risk assessments, policy and program responses, capacity building initiatives, knowledge management strategies. Thomas works, Thomas works closely with partners from across and beyond the United Nations system and represents DPPA in the Climate Security Mechanism, a joint initiative by DPPA, UNDP, and UNF. Thomas, welcome, and we certainly do hope that today we will benefit from the broad understanding that you bring to this conversation on security and climate change. In addition to Thomas, on my esteemed panel today, I do have Ms. Esther Obaiko. She is a lawyer with 25 years of experience in legal and social research in environmental, gender, and land. Esther has broad experience in policy development, legislative drafting, and sensitization on land and natural resources. Esther has previously worked as the country coordinator for the World Bank's Land Assessment Framework. LGAF from 2012 to 2014. She coordinated the Global Land Indicators Initiative at the Global Land Tool Network, GLTN, um, with UN Habitat, which focused on developing land indicators for the SDGs and supported the broadening land monitoring globally. She most recently supported the development of the International Land Coalition and National Engagement Strategy, ILCNES, process in Uganda. Esther is currently coordinating a project aimed at improving land governance in the IGAD region that has resulted in the establishment of a land unit at the IGAD Secretariat. With this wealth of experience, we certainly do hope that Esther 
will bring, and do know that she will only bring valuable contributions to our panel today. Finally, and not in any way the least, I would like to introduce Professor Kameri Mbote, a professor of law and former dean of the School of Law in West of Nairobi in Kenya, where she has taught for over 30 years. She earned her doctorate from Stanford University in 1999, focusing on property rights, biodiversity conservation. Professor Bote is senior counsel and was awarded an honorary degree in law by the Invest of Oslo in 2017 for her work on development, environment, and women's rights. She has published widely on land rights, environment, and gender. Her latest work, Contending Norms in a Plural Legal System, The Limits of Formal Law, was the basis of a higher doctorate award from the University of Nairobi in December in 2019. I would like to also indicate that my colleague Marco Longhost from IDLO is part of the panel. Marco will bring practical experiences from our perspective as IDLO. Marco holds a Master's of Law specializing in legal anthropology and legal history, and he is also a holder of a PhD in economics. He works currently as IDLO's IL advisor and program development advisor. And in the past two years, Marco has led the development and startup of IDLO's program on strengthening the administration of criminal justice in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. He specializes in criminal justice, land governance, land dispute resolution, and customary law. Marco is a member of the management committee of the Dutch Knowledge Platform for Security and Rule of Law, and is also a member of the Land at Scale Advisory Committee. It is again my hope that Marco will certainly bring the practical experiences that IDLO has encountered through our Sahel program. With those words, I would like to certainly welcome our panel and invite Thomas to begin his intervention. Thank you very much uh, to you, Romualdo, and to the organizers of the Berlin Climate Security Conference for inviting me uh, to join this panel. It's certainly a, a timely conversation and a really good opportunity um, to discuss the important linkages between climate change uh, and, and security. At the UN, we're trying to develop integrated approaches to these linkages between climate change and security and to strengthen partnerships for innovative solutions. The climate security mechanism, which you mentioned in your kind introduction, is a reflection of this interagency effort, bringing together um, DPPA, UNEP, and UNDP, as well as a range of other uh, UN entities from across the three pillars of the UN system. Just at, at the outset, let me just re-emphasize what you already said, which is that there is no deterministic relationship between climate change and security. The experience on the ground that we have gathered so far shows that the effects of climate change in combination with other socioeconomic and political pressures can um, undermine stability and, and pose a risk for human security and, and even national security, especially in already fragile countries. But those pathways through which the climate change impacts um, uh, peace and security are very contextual, they're very interdependent and, and non-linear. So climate change is a very complex phenomenon. It, it works across different timelines, across different geographies, and I think that makes it really difficult for us um, collectively uh, to find appropriate responses. And ultimately, to prevent the emergence of climate-related security risks, we need to build the resilience of states and communities by making sure that our security initiatives are climate informed on the one hand and on the other hand that our development and climate adaptation projects are also conflict sensitive so we have to sort of break down the silos between what traditionally have been fairly uh, disconnected um, interventions uh, unfortunately too many times and rule of law i think plays a, a really important role in all of this and i just want to highlight two examples um, of this today the first area I want to highlight is the, the long term, the best way to prevent the emergence of climate related security risks is, of course, to slow down climate change. So, in other words, is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions we're currently producing in the world collectively. And in that regard, environmental rule of law is important because 
It allows us to set, implement, and also enforce safeguards to protect the environment and mitigate climate change. Um, that includes, of course, the full implementation of the Paris Agreement, which is a key part um, of, of our global efforts to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Climate trust is, is an important element of that conversation, and maybe we can come to that a little later in terms of moving the conversation to focus on the most vulnerable uh, communities out there, especially those who have contributed very little to climate change in the first place, but are now suffering the most from these consequences, which of course includes also the Sahel with a, a next to nothing, uh, very small contribution to climate change, but suffering from the consequences of it, including on peace and security, of course. And then the, the second area I want to highlight, uh, besides the environmental rule of law, is the role that rule of law plays for sustainable development and socio-political stability. And the concept note for this session um, already pointed to it. Rule of law in the Sahel is key in other places as well, of course, but especially also in the Sahel, is key to regulating access to land and other natural resources, and also the, the, the use of and sharing of these resources. And the biophysical manifestations of climate change and environmental change, such as uh, floods and droughts and storms and desertification, often reduce the availability and the productivity of land. Uh, in, a, in an area such as the Sahel, where about 70% of the population depends on agriculture and livestock rearing for their livelihoods, any change in this environment and in the availability of land and water, of course, is a huge issue. 70% is, is, a, is a very high number reliant on, on primary factors in the environment. So any reduction here can really lead to, to problems and can contribute to tensions and aggravate tensions. And just to be clear, when we talk about herd of farmer conflicts, we're not suggesting that climate change is the reason behind herd of farmer conflicts or that climate change started these conflicts to often go back decades or even centuries. But climate change is a contributing factor by reducing the resource base, especially at a time of, uh, of the growing populations in many places. Climate change really can become a factor of contributing to the increasing violence we've seen in recent years in uh, pastoral conflicts. So to mitigate these effects of climate change, we need legal mechanisms at the local, national, and also at the regional levels um, that help us uh, create and ensure peaceful sharing of, of natural resources. And this is where the rule of law comes, comes in and plays an important role. But what we see, unfortunately, is that oftentimes uh, land and water laws are not really coordinated very much or they're not implemented consistently between uh, states or within states. So there's issues of coherence and, and coordination that make it difficult sometimes to, to get a clear, a clear code of law to help us understand and, and regulate access to natural resources. In the Sahel, however, there are some countries that have developed pretty strong pastoral codes and local mechanisms to resolve disputes through dialogue and peaceful arrangements. So there is some good practice already we can draw on in terms of conflict prevention and peaceful coexistence also between different user groups of natural resources. I just want to highlight here, for instance, some of the work that the UN Office for West Africa and the Sahel, you know us for short, uh, has done jointly with ECOWAS, the Economic Commission for West Africa um, and the Sahel, to identify some of these lessons learned and to build stronger uh, legal frameworks. Um, maybe just in the interest of time, I'll keep it to, to one key lesson that has come out of this joint work and, and uh, the, the search for good practices and identifying lessons learned, which is the need to combine formal practices with customer practices. So really to develop hybrid approaches that link both, both of those systems. And when it comes to formal practices, for instance, um, national and regional laws related to transhumanists are very important. And there is already in the region a transhumanist protocol in West Africa led by ECOWAS, which encompasses parts of the Sahel as well, not all of the Sahel, but um, parts of the Sahel, uh, Central and Western Sahel. Um, however, unfortunately, the protocol is from the 1990s, the late 90s, and in some places, it doesn't really match very well anymore with today's realities on the ground. So there needs to be some work to review and update some of the provisions in a transhumanist protocol uh, in the region. And then there's at the other level I mentioned, the customary arrangements that are very important, oftentimes found at the, at the local level. And there are many such agreements, really, that are very effective at preventing and resolving conflict by including uh, effective communities into the decision making, especially women and, and youth. So from our experience, then it's very important to empower local mechanisms, uh, especially in places where the state has very weak uh, legitimacy or capacity. So when we speak about the rule of law, it's also important to keep in mind uh, the rule of whose laws we are, we're trying to establish in places where 
uh, the state is either too weak or, or does not enjoy high levels of legitimacy, it may not be easy or, or very conducive to peace if you follow those laws or expect um, those laws to, to create peace. So the challenge then is to, to find ways that allow us to reconcile the need for broader, more formal protocols on, on transhumance, for instance, with the flexibility of local arrangements and the buying of communities. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that and having pointed out these, these couple of, of issues here, I'm um, curious to hear what, what colleagues have to say and engage in the discussion um, following the other presentations. I would just wrap up then by saying that rule of law approaches really can play an important role as part of broader integrated and cross-cutting approaches to prevent and manage security risks linked to climate change. And uh, thank you again for the invitation to, to speak today. Back to you, Romualdo. Thank you very much, Tobes. Um, certainly your starting point that uh, you probably need to first start off by reducing or slowing the rate of climate change is a key factor in itself. Um, and uh, we can hear from our quote, um, Esther, in terms of uh, what, if any, answers to Thomas or issues do you think are equally pertinent in this discussion? Very much. Um, so um, I'll. I'll I'll make a presentation that uh, will not repeat what Thomas has said because there are some issues in common. But really for the Sahel region and stretching all the way to the Horn of Africa, it's not uncommon for you to see images like this of increasing land degradation. And it's also not uncommon for you to see images like this of floods and um, loss of livelihoods. Um, and then it's also not uncommon for you to see images like this across the Sahel. All these images create uh, the nexus between um, climate change and conflict, and therefore the human security elements in that. And so um, when we look at climate change, much as Thomas says there's no direct correlation, but climate change ends up being a threat multiplier. As you can see, because of the results of climate change or impacts of climate change, vulnerability increases. And, and under vulnerability, we have issues around food security, water security itself, and then human health. We also have issues around availability of natural resources and competing for, for scarce resources. All these push stresses which make, um, which make us see issues around migration emerge. And the movement of people usually also raises issues around political destabilization and therefore conflict. And so the debate currently we have in the continent is to create a clear nexus. We know that, for example, climate-induced migrations are not protected in the region and that these are the issues that mostly have now raised um, the urgency for the movement of people and uh, are raising uh, issues around um, violent extremism in the region. So you find that youth who have been rendered um, jobless or that do not have livelihoods anymore have taken on arms because there is a case of who cares, who is really caring about my issues. So you find a lot of antagonism between communities uh, in the Sahel that would all, will mostly be pastoralists versus sedentary farmers. You'll find rising inequality, raising concerns. States are weakening. Uh, you'd find discontentment with what government actions are. Food prices are going up. Um, mobilization of people is not effective and also the migration and all these are drivers that are leading to conflict in the region. And therefore, um, what are the challenges what challenges do we see when, it, when we are trying to address concerns around the rule of law? Of course, we are breaking down this to only think about it in terms of environment, but actually when you think about climate change, it, it impacts everything and affects everything. 
So it needs to have a holistic approach to addressing issues that would then enable the human security to be realized and human rights to be realized. So issues around food and water security, biodiversity, public health, land use and urban planning and mobility all need to be addressed in tandem. If we think about addressing issues around climate change as a sovereign matter, it also raises the whole issue around identities. Who are the citizens to which you are responding? And we know that, for example, in the Sahel, one tribe cuts across countries. Africa is like that. It's the same people across countries, and it's the same um, traits that we see across countries. And therefore, a transnational or and a transversal approach needs to be um, uh, put in place. And so we need those pathways to ensure co uh, collaboration happens, a collaborative response across countries, other than just looking at it as a, a matter of, sovereign, of a sovereign state. We also cannot address it only using environmental law tools. We need to address or uh, uh, focus on issues around resilience and how best to integrate social and legal systems. At the moment, we are looking at them as two separate things, and this has resulted into non-progress in addressing issues around uh, climate change that has res resulted into conflict in the Sahel region. We also need to think about a more holistic approach on how best to engage in the rule of law. And uh, in our view, dealing, bringing in the whole element of traditional approaches, alternative dispute resolution goes a long way other than just focusing on uh, statutory measures in addressing um, issues of climate change and their threat to human security. And so some of the responses that we are seeing at the continent at a regional level, that is thinking about it in a transnational way, we have seen protocols come about, and these are legal instruments that countries have put together or as regions we have the free movement, or free movement protocol uh, for, the con for the whole continent, which is the CFTA. And then we have that in West Africa and in the IGAD region as well. And these are helping uh, in terms of agreements that are reached to deal with issues of trade, movement of um, cattle and movement of people, as well as addressing human security issues. We have convergence frameworks at ECOWAS and at IGAD region, and this is issues that member states agree to work on in common as relates to land governance. One of those is the area of land and conflict, and as well as climate change. There are the issues around uh, alternative dispute resolution across borders, and the adoption of a, a count of a cluster approach, meaning that countries that share common border and there are conflicts, for example, the Somali cluster, you, are deal, you deal with those issues at cluster level with only a certain number of countries addressing such issues. The other one is strengthening land use and management and the restoration of degraded land, um, lands. From this, we have the hypothesis that a hungry person has no options, which means that if I'm hungry, I'm not going to listen, I'm going to fight. So if we can address the root causes that result into food insecurity, then you are already addressing issues, that issues around conflict as well in that. The other is um, how best to sustainably improve service delivery to marginal areas. And we find that conflicts are mainly um, around marginal lands, and those are also happen to be mostly areas that are cross-border. And so how best do we deal with um, political and economic issues in, in cross-border areas and marginal lands to ensure that we arrest the potency of conflict in those areas? Um, lastly, um, this is the current image. This is September, actually, and this is a city. This is Khartoum. We are looking at the impact of climate change. We all know what's happening in Khartoum. Right now, there is conflict, and then there is a climate change issue going on. What does that mean? We are dealing with real issues. We are dealing with real people. We are dealing with real suffering. People are dying. So we need to find practical mechanisms that, and the Nile cuts across so many countries. This is a matter that, we, these are the images for which we are speaking to today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Esther, for that uh, very concise uh, contribution. 
Um, certainly, the need for a holistic approach to addressing issues around climate change is a critical issue. And um, I will now turn to my colleague, Marco, and uh, ask Marco if you can share with us uh, some of our experiences also as IDL and how we are dealing with some of the issues around um, security that are arise in the Sahel region. Thank you, Marco. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Romualdo, and thank you to the conference organizers for the opportunity to speak about IDLO's uh, experiences uh, in implementing a program in the Sahel, in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger to strengthen criminal justice systems. So in, the, um, in our program, in our theory of change, we recognize conflicts about natural resources as a major source of violence, violence for the populations that the populations suffer from uh, in the areas where we work, um, and violence that finds its way to the courts that we support. Now, these uh, are primarily disputes about uh, land and water. These are disputes that can oppose individuals, but often will oppose uh, whole communities. And indeed, as my uh, co-panelists have said, they can be disputes about uh, between uh, pastoralists and agricultural communities, but also uh, internal to those communities. Um, one of the signs that we see that these uh, disputes are increasing, or conflicts, I should say, are uh, in increasing in intensity is, for example, the fact that our partners, judges, tell us that the proportion of land-related criminal cases in their dockets are increasing. I think it's um, well known and understood uh, that these type of conflicts are caused by a wide range of factors, uh, population density and growth uh, in a context of poverty and very limited of farm um, or livestock rearing uh, opportunities, alternatives to those. Uh, climate change has been mentioned, uh, changing planting and herding cycles and uh, movement patterns. Very important also uh, terrorism and armed conflict, uh, reduce uh, safe space and uh, make that population uh, pressure increase elsewhere. Uh, unhelpful uh, divisionist politics uh, are a problem that uh, fuels these disputes. And last on my list, but certainly uh, not least among these factors are poorly functioning land governance institutions and uh, systems. Now justice understood broadly is uh, key to the management and mitigation of these type of uh, uh, conflicts. Um, due to time constraints, I must say it a bit uh, more boldly and less nuanced than I would like, but there is quite a lot of um, uh, room for improvement there. If I summarize, um, we see community-based dispute resolution uh, mechanisms so at the base that suffer from problems with inclusivity and legitimacy and that struggle to bring these type of conflicts to a durable end. Um, we see civil justice systems that are severely backlogged, uh, difficult to access for justice seekers and especially for vulnerable populations. Um, and that sadly are often affected by uh, problems of corruption. We see criminal justice systems where these uh, disputes end up if and when they have turned violent that suffer from many of the same problems. And uh, administrative justice, so a justice in relation to uh, uh, decisions by the state or by local authorities in relation to land is virtually inexistent. Um, I think it's, it's very important to emphasize also that uh, justice is not just a solution waiting to be properly implemented in the Sahel region. It, injustice is very much also one of the key causes of violence and extremism in our experience. Um, so impunity, that is the lack of uh, an effective response on the part of, of justice institutions to the violence that populations uh, experience but also impunity for injustices committed by state actors, the defense and security forces, but sadly also from within the justice system, um, drive people away from the state. And to make things more complex, um, 
the state's monopoly uh, in the administration of justice is being challenged uh, in much of the Sahel uh, through self-defense groups and jihadist groups who seek to monopolize the administration of justice. Um, so thinking about solutions, I think uh, both Thomas and, and Esther have, have already mentioned it in, in different um, words, but given that this is uh, a multi-dimensional problem, I think it's very important that the response is uh, an integrated one and a cross-sectoral one. Too often, I think, in our development work, uh, we box ourselves into uh, sectors. There's, there's clearly a plethora of, of coordination uh, mechanisms and initiatives in the Sahel. I think uh, on the ground, these are not very effective in general. And I think the recent experience in Mali are in part an, uh, uh, a result of that. So I think there are two aspects of these problems with natural resource conflicts that we can help address uh, from a rule of law perspective. Um, I would focus on conflict prevention by strengthening community-based dispute resolution on the ground um, and by focusing on mitigating escalation into violence by strengthening criminal justice systems. Uh, when it comes to the first uh, community-based mechanisms, I think this is something not to be approached uh, with naivety. I think there's big, big challenges um, that we face as a development community in dealing with those issues. Um, I would uh, pull your attention to problems of institutional multiplicity, of vague and overlapping mandates, of normative confusion, forum shopping, and essentially at this level, um, I think the challenge is to find ways of, uh, uh, of reaching durable solutions, uh, solutions to, to conflicts uh, that last. When it comes to the penal chain, um, institutional capacity, strengthening thereof, um, and fostering access to justice for justice seekers, obviously, are key. I think something that, that doesn't get enough attention um, is, is uh, strengthening systems of checks and balances within criminal justice systems to avoid these type of abuses of power that are, uh, uh, that are prevalent in the region. Uh, Romada, I think there's much more uh, to be said. Uh, there's a, a lot of nuance missing in what I just said, but I think I'll leave it there in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, for that uh, quick synopsis of the issues that we currently dealing and faced with. Um, certainly the multi-dimensional nature of the crisis and the need um, to have that holistic approach keeps coming up and uh, and that you raise uh, about the need for improvement in terms of coordination um, even from our perspective as development partners is absolutely critical and they need to ensure that there are no overlapping methods um, uh, all comes into order contextualization of uh, a holistic approach properly calibrated. I will now turn to, certainly not last, uh, because she's the last speaker, uh, but uh, to Professor Mbote to also give us their perspectives, um, again, trying to focus back to our original three questions. Thank you, Professor. Mm. Thank you very much, um, Romualdo. Uh, I think my co-panelists have uh, canvassed a lot of issues and uh, I'm, not, I'm going to be brief, but I think uh, the whole question of context is very critical because when you look at the Sahel, you're looking at an area that is ecologically vulnerable, but also a place where the people are vulnerable. Somebody talked about, one of the panelists talked about the poverty levels and uh, the fact that we have uh, uh, violent extremism and conflicts in this space. When you look at uh, the conflicts that occur in most parts of Africa, natural resources are at the heart of those conflicts. And uh, here speaking broadly, it could be abundance in some places where there's too much, you have uh, conflict over the resources, but scarcity also causes um, and conflicts. When we have degradation and depletion of resources as happens in uh, ecologically marginal 
environments, there can arise a couple of challenges. One would be the supply induced, where more is needed than is available. But you could also have cultural, I mean, uh, structural scarcities, where you have holding of resources being skewed and limiting access for some. When you have environmental scarcities, then that can lead to migration, social segmentation. And uh, when climate change comes in this, I think it's Esther who said uh, what the IP IPCC has uh, repeated often, that climate change amplifies threats. And in the Sahel, we already have a constrained space. So uh, you have uh, these amplified. And you can have climate change then being um, uh, in the midst of the sources of conflict, where they are already social, economical, I mean, economic and ecological imbalances between different people over land and pasture, and where there are gender, generational, and socioeconomic um, inequalities, uh, where there are also, as we see in a lot of these spaces, uh, no democratic legitimacy or good governance, and the communities are weakened then climate change can be uh, what becomes the source of conflict. It can be the trigger uh, where you have uh, climate change induced uh, extreme weather, severe droughts, or it can even uh, sustain conflicts where it aggravates or perpetuates an ongoing conflict or spoils or undermines opportunities for peace. The rule of law is very important in this kind of uh, context uh, in addressing both the human security issues and climate risks. And the essence of the rule of law is that people should be governed by a set of uh, rules. And where you're talking about ecological um, vulnerability, you're looking at environmental sustainability, but you're also looking at implementation and enforcement. And uh, in the Sahel, as uh, in many parts of Africa, uh, there is no shortage of uh, laws governing the environment because countries are parties to international and uh, regional treaties. There are also national laws and regulations which uh, govern uh, how uh, governmental services and goods are distributed and are supposed also to imbue accountability and transparency. Uh, a lot of the rule of law norms are in environmental governance. And when people talk about the rule of law, it is contradistinguished to the rule of men because people subject themselves to a set of norms and whether they like it or not, they will obey them because that is what is required of them rather than having uh, brute force or those that have more power than others loading it on those that don't have power. And uh, environmental governance, as has been said by many of my pan uh, co-panelists, occurs at different levels, uh, local, regional, national, and international. And in fact, when you look at uh, rule of law, it has both substantive and procedural aspects. There are norms and values, but there are also processes for getting the norms and values working. And I think when people talk about um, alternative dispute resolution mechanism, traditional justice systems, you're looking more at both the norms, but also the processes that are used. Uh, these procedural and substantive aspects of the rule of law are embedded in uh, the Sahel within plural legal systems, where there exists more than one legal order. And here we have a very strong uh, operation of uh, Kashmir and uh, religious laws. And uh, these can give rise to supremacy contests between different operative uh, norms. So when a climate change then that is occurring at local levels where people interact with the environment, will be addressed by rule of law actors, structures, and interests that are very diverse. And uh, to effectively address security and climate risks using law, it is imperative in my view that norms and processes from all legal orders are integrated. So if we only use formal law, which was majorly brought through colonialism, we leave out a whole universe of people's lived 
realities where the only law people interact with is Kashmir or religious law. And this, in my view, limits the role of law and also the rule of law because of the contest between legality, what is formally legal, and legitimacy, what people accept to be binding upon them. So in conclusion, for the rule of law to effectively address security and climate risks, it is important to define law to include informal Kashmir law and religious law. And here we are talking about norms, values, processes, and procedures. It's also important to unpack and distill elements of formal and informal law so that we know what are these and what are we dealing with, and we assess the role that different elements of law, uh, what the role of different elements of law are in security and climate risks. And here we have to take into account that it, the, the role they have could be positive or negative. And therefore, we need to be nuanced in looking at uh, all the laws that we have, whether they are formal or informal. I think it was Marco who talked about uh, where you can have Kashmir law that allows unjust norms against uh, young males or against women. And that needs to be uh, taken into account so that you do not uh, make the situation of these groups worse. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, and to all the panelists, thank you very much for your very valued contributions. Uh, I do appreciate that uh, certainly a lot more could have been said, um, but uh, due to time constraints, we're not able to cover every aspect of your various presentations. Um, we have received quite a number of uh, very interesting questions, um, and I will try to go through some of them um, and certainly uh, direct some to spe some are specific and some are general. Maybe if I can start with um, uh, Thomas. Um, the, the, the question from uh, Jean-Louis Pont um, is whether you think environmental and climate change is so, different, is so a different status that it has to be qualified as multiply and not a root cause um, or a full driver of conflict in itself. Uh, yeah, thanks Romualdo and thanks uh, Shunri for the for the question. Um, I, I think we need to be careful not to overestimate, but of course also not to underestimate the, the role of climate change um, in peace and security and as a contributing factor um, to conflict. And I think we need to be guided by science and, and to some extent um, the evidence on a quantitative basis so far at least has not uh, conclusively shown that Apps and everything else, or all else being equal, the climate change will lead to, to conflict. Um, if I understand the, the question correctly from, from Jean Louis. So I think that the, the accurate and more constructive approach would be to look at climate change as one factor in a network, network of complex factors. And we've heard other colleagues on the, on the panel today talk about, uh, about other sources of grievances, uh, about poverty and, and whatnot. Um, so I think we need to be guided by the understanding that very few things uh, in the, the social sphere, in the human sphere, happen due to any singular reason. And climate change, I would posit so far, based on our experience, is an aggravating factor rather than a, a sole individual uh, root cause of conflict. I would also um, point to some of the, the reporting that's been done um, by think tanks in in, in Africa, in Europe, and in North America, who on a qualitative basis, um, rather than a purely quantitative basis, on a qualitative basis, look into this issue as well and have come to, to similar conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, the next question, I will, I will pass that on to Esther. Um, and the question is uh, from Osini Kalu. Um, and the question is, how likely is it that the UN Security Council will push for a resolution on climate security 
Um, what are the trends and factors that may sustain the likelihood? Hi, I, I think Thomas would best answer that question. He's an insider. Thomas, would you want to have a go on that one? <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you for the redirect. Um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a fair question, but of course, it's uh, very much uh, in the domain of member states to, to have the conversation. Security Council is not up to, to me or, or any one of us really here to, uh, to make any assumptions of what the, of the Security Council will do about climate security. I would point out, though, that in 2011, there was a presidential statement on climate security that was thematic in nature. So it was uh, cross-cutting, not tied to specific uh, regional context or geographic context. And in the last uh, three and a half years, since uh, March 2017, we've had about a dozen resolutions on particular country or regional context that reference the importance of climate security in the Security Council. Um, other issues or other pointers given uh, the interest of the Security Council or pointing to the interest of the Security Council, um, you can find in recent open debates. There was one in July, there was an RF formula meeting in April. There'll be another open debate this week, in fact, um, on the issue of humanitarian effects of climate change and, and issues related to insecurity as well. So I think there's a body of evidence and a body of work in the Security Council that points to a sustained interest in the Council on the issue of climate security. And uh, I would expect that that continues, but it's not really up to me to, to, to make an assumption on whether or not there will be a particular resolution on this issue on a thematic basis. But I think there's strong evidence that the Council remain seized of the matter, as, uh, as I frequently say. Esther, you, you're not going to get off easy. Um, Hossein uh, Kalu has come back, and he has got a question which he says is specifically for you. And he says, um, the question is, the Climate Commission for the SIO region, uh, what are the mechanisms for funding, and what are the concrete tasks that the Climate Commission has done. Um, thank you so much. I think, um, as 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 we know that the issues around cl climate change, whereas we talk about them, I think the redirecting of funding has always been a challenge, uh, given the scope and the um, and the breadth of what needs to be done. The Climate Commission, of course, has, has therefore faced a number of challenges in pulling off real actions because of the limits in its budget. I, I would also ask my colleagues to, uh, to intervene. I think there's a lot more support towards the environmental side of things other than the security side of things. And also the, the impacts of climate change in terms of the movement of people does not gain as much traction except when people are moving out of the continent. And all these things, we're talking today about climate change as a human security issue in that context, is still a very young field that needs further interrogation. And I think on the continent, this is a conversation that needs to be broadened. Even for the Sahel, it's a conversation that needs to be broadened and um, taken on more seriously in the context of the Paris Agreement as well. Um, that's what I could say at this point, but I'll let my colleagues fill in where they feel like uh, they, they have additional information regarding the functioning of the Climate Commission for the Sahel specifically. It's like not enough is being done in that regard at the moment. Thanks, uh, any additionals from the panel members on this particular question? If there are no addition to this particular point, what I will do is I will take a few more questions uh, that I have received. Um, we are not going to be able to certainly respond to each and every question, so some of them I'm going to buy. Um, there is a question that uh, was posed by Isabel um, to Marco, the Glenic to Marco, um, and uh, I am combining that with a question also received from Hawa Ibrahim, um, where this Chen Marco is, um, 
what role can be played by organizations uh, also such as IDLO and um, what uh, concrete um, checks and uh, how can we concretely implement the checks and balances within the penal chain um, to ensure that we do certainly reduce conflict around climate change. Thank you, Romualdo. Um, I can tell you what um, what we do uh, to work on checks and balances within a criminal justice system, but I should uh, specify that this is, uh, I wouldn't say a nascent, but certainly a somewhat new area of work for us, so something that we are gathering experience uh, with. Uh, and hopefully I would have a more complete answer for you if we do this sometime again next year. Um, but uh, we work uh, on the one hand uh, within uh, the penal chain, so with justice institutions uh, themselves, um, work together, for example, with inspectorates, uh, work together with statistics services to make sure that uh, information about the performance, about the functioning of the penal chain is broadly available within the chain and beyond. Um, we work with prosecutors' offices, for example, to strengthen their capacities to uh, monitor detention facilities. Um, we very much also um, work with external uh, checks and balance. So firstly, with national human rights committees play an important role in monitoring of the administration of criminal justice and specifically also uh, the monitoring of detention facilities. Um, and we work with uh, civil society and civil society platforms uh, who, uh, who monitor again the work uh, of the penal chain. So, with all of that, we try to uh, create or, or help create uh, an environment where the, uh, the justice sector is more accountable and uh, more scrutinized and hopefully producing better results. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marco. Um, I, I am very mindful of our time. We have literally five minutes left. Um, I will pick one question for Prof Mbote so that uh, you do not get to go away without having been grilled as well. Um, and the question that I have you, Prof, is what would you say about the politics around climate change? Um, because uh, as Salom Gore suggests in their question, this appears to be a major impediment to the rule of law in, environment and in environmental governance. What would be your response to that? If you can very quickly, in less than two minutes, try and respond to that question, Paul. I will be more brief than two minutes. I think uh, politics of climate change have been uh, with climate change since the phenomenon came up. And I, one of the issues that uh, one has to consider when you're thinking about environments like the Sahel is that when the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was crafted in uh, 1992, there was also another convention which uh, many people actually call the African Convention. That's the Des Desertification Convention. But uh, when you look at the traction around that, there hasn't been much. And maybe if there was more uh, breaking of, uh, st of silos, like Tom was saying, uh, we may have uh, a lot better interventions for climate change. Thank you, Prof. Again, uh, allow me to thank our esteemed panel, um, Thomas, Esther, Marco, Prof Mbote. Um, the discussions have been very insightful. Um, I know that there are a lot of questions that uh, we have not been able to canvas um, and uh, there has been a lot of requests also on the chat for your various presentations, uh, realizing that we, do, we did not have sufficient time to go through them. Um, at this point, I also continue to have that conversation to see how we can avail those presentations. Um, and hopefully also try and see how we can continue to respond to some of the questions that were being raised. 
Um, at this point, I would like once again to thank all uh, the participants, everyone who has joined us today. Thank our co-organizers for this very important opportunity to reflect on a very critical area. And I want to wish you all um, a good day, a good evening, uh, wherever you are, and uh, reiterate that uh, we do sincerely thank you for your participation in this particular webinar. Thank you. Good evening.